took over and you started recording. <laughs> <laughs> They're funny, talented, what was it? Handsome. Mike Warwick, Anton Petlango, Mensa
started here, but um, once again, this is Anton. I'm Michael. A lot of people know him as the thin one and me as the handsome one. And uh, anyways, let's get started. Yeah, here's the wrappers we're going to be using. Um, a couple seascapes, a lot of bulk. Yeah, both of these were provided by local photographers whose names I unfortunately did not write down. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, and we will put that information up when we post everything. But anyways, that was really nice of them. Anyhow, round one. Round one. Go ahead. Anybody want to do a timer for us? What do we want to do? 15 minutes? Yeah. Let's do a switch on about every 15 minutes. And oh man, we're almost on schedule. Five after. So you start. Oh, and I'm going to carry some started. We don't talk first, we don't plan first, we don't think about it first. It's, yeah, I mean, seriously. Like every year, I'm like, why did we do this? And normally, I'm just in my studio by myself, listening to my nice classical piano music. Nobody's talking, nobody's the heck of the Oh. I think it's 
But I didn't put out like it. Yeah, let's just do that. Yeah.
Oh yeah, we limited uh, capacity and, I don't know, a little bit of post COVID, like everything is. But it's nice to go um, back to Northern California to paint. I really like that coastline. So again, please ask questions. If we get quiet for a little bit, there's times where it is harder to think, talk, paint. When you're painting, every brush stroke is about 20 to 30 decisions in a single brush stroke. You know, how thick is the paint? What color is the paint? What temperature is the paint? What's the pressure of the brush stroke? What angle am I going at it? Um, so, yeah, we're burning calories here. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I just like to remember that because I always wonder, like, why is painting for four hours a day or three hours a day so taxing when, you know, it seems like it's an easy job. It should be just enjoyable, you're relaxing, but I don't know if any of you speak a foreign language, but just barely, and trying to talk that foreign language is so tiring, and you're constantly, uh, uh, uh. That's basically what painting is like. It's like having kind of like a limited... For you. For me, it's like I'm very fluent. <laughs> But yeah, no, yeah, it's a strangely tiring thing, and it doesn't seem like it. Because most people, most students, when they come, they're like, oh, I want to paint because I just want to relax and have a good time. And I'm like, oh, you need a different touch. Yeah, not quite a good job. Um, and I was like, oh no, is he been telling his 
uh, parents. <laughs> bad person, so I had to back up and leave. Um, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, my favorite spots. I mean, I love candy. Really, really, really do. Uh, love teaching workshops out here. Love showing a dragon fire gallery. We both show a dragon fire gallery, by, uh, by the way. Um, You're at 14 minutes. Okay, good. Can't wait for him to. For once, I'm going to want you to come and save it. Yeah. <laughs> or at least get it going. I've been talking too much. I know. Hey, Michael. Um, Michael doesn't have a lot of friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is my two hours a year. I don't have to bear with him. <laughs> I've got a whole COVID worth of things to talk to you people about. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love. I love uh, going on doing small sketches, working in the studio, I love taking photos, working in the studio. Um, yeah, I love the gorge as well. Um, there's a, a creek between here and Portland off Highway 26. It's called Humbug Creek, I believe. Um, for some reason, I find that place really, really charming. It's so interesting that it's just right off the highway, but nobody goes down there, and it's just beautiful. And it's pretty easy to track around. Um, and then also, I just love um, little local. I live in suburbia, Beaverton. And so it's so cool you can find these little pockets of uh, wetlands, protected little areas. And you know, you just take out Costco in the background or Nike in the background. <laughs> um, nobody knows that I am go trekking in for 10 miles. And, um, you know, Beaverton Creek itself, the, you know, the one the town is named after. I really enjoy painting it. It's a, not even much of a creek, it's more of just a, a marsh. It's been um, dammed up by the beavers and everything. And it's just been fun watching it over the 16 years I've lived out there and you know watching the viewers dam it and then slowly filling in with silt and now it's got a bunch of uh, irises and I think some lilies might be starting up and it's just interesting to watch nature change and to actually go out and observe it in a deeper way versus just zooming by in your car or whatever else. Um, all right. And then, uh, woo! <laughs> So the this one is Anton's work. So you know you guys are welcome not only to talk and heckle Anton and stuff, you guys can also come up and walk around and look if you want to get a little closer. Um, do that. Unfortunately, Anton and I are not wearing masks, so just be aware of that. Um, but, you know, if you want to get a closer look or some photos or whatever. And then I do, um, you know, we'll, we'll take a break and, you know, after a couple rotations, come up and look at Anton's painting. And I, I just want you to look at this brush stroke right here. And then go over to my painting and go, there's more painting in that brush stroke than on that painting. And how is that one so much better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. I absolutely adore Anton's work. I really, really do. Uh, it's so fun to go out and paint with him and be challenged by his um, beliefs, painting styles. Uh, and, and just talking about art. Uh, talking about art is so fun because it's so different. Um, his has got this tactile quality that mine often doesn't. Um, mine's all about light and atmosphere and what's yours about? <laughs> yes, I can. Um, we're, we're just visiting town, so I don't know. You, you both mentioned the gallery that what you have other work on display here mm -hmm. in town. Yeah, yeah, Dragon Fire Gallery. It's okay. uh, just kind of right beneath picking a pancake on the south end of downtown, not the south end of town, but south end of downtown. First and then First and half, thank you. Um, super fun, super colorful, really lots of lots and lots of front work. Um, yeah, please just check it out. And tell them you like it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
really, really depends. Um, yeah. So that painting, um, basically, when the galleries like would do the show was a couple weeks ago. I mean, we kind of knew, but uh, the galleries like we need some more pieces, especially maybe a haystack rock or you know some beach seeds. So I did that one and three others starting about three weeks ago. But I'm working on them all at the same time because of the style I use, not like Anton. Anton is very direct, almost a la prima kind of, not exactly, but very direct. Uh, mine is building up these transparent layers. Um, I love letting the light shine through. Um, and uh, so mine can take months, but it's not like I'm, when I say that, I'm not sitting there painting on it for months. I'm sitting there watching it dry. <laughs> so that's why I paint on you know, multiple paintings at a time. Um, yeah, my studio work is very much like that as well. I'll have anywhere from 10 to 20 or 30 paintings that I'm working on. The drying racks are just stuck. And, and it's, um, tell them how, so, I mean, how what the pace of drying kind is for oils. Yeah, it's like um, oil paint will sometimes take several days or a week to just kind of skin over. And then if I want uh, uh, some of the, uh, some the layers to firm up even more, I'll have to like, wait months for some paintings that they'll make out of the studio for years. Um, an oil paint, a thick oil painting to fully dry, the same can take six months to a year. Yeah. Um, for mine, being thinner, it can be a couple of weeks. Um, so that's, you know, when I hear about artists that only work on one painting at a time, it just kind of baffles my mind of, yeah. what are they doing Why? at the time? Yeah. They're, they're, they're baiting their children. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. Let them paint kids play with their own oil paints. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's the editing process like? Do you do a layer, oh my gosh, it's not working for me, or if I did this, can you break it off? Or Um, it depends for me. Sometimes I'll leave it and I'll like the texture that it leaves and I'll just paint over it. And if it becomes, um, yeah, it's fighting with the division I have for painting, I'll just scrape it off. But I, I paint and I paint over old paintings often. It's <laughs> the whole painting, I'll just turn it upside down.
were kind of thinking, we're hoping for two hours. When we first did our first couple of these, we set these firm deadlines. And I think it does add a certain sense of uh, impending doom and adventure. And, um,
it's all about the design and uh, getting everything lined up. Um, but I do love, like I said, I do love plein air painting. Um, I do love the more intuitive stuff. It's just kind of not been my... Just doesn't love you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> doesn't love me back always. Um, yeah, Anton's been pretty clever to make a career out of the, out of doing the, the thing that he really likes. And I also feel like I'm really, really, really lucky that I get to make my you know, career off um, painting. I love all of it. Um, did that answer the questions? Did I answer it too much? So Anton, is the orange, is that already dry in the background? Is that what? Is it dry already? Did you go over? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the best idea for this style of painting. Yeah, you just yeah, want to let it dry and doing all these different things. Um, one of my favorite styles of painting is actually a, kind of a subtractive style, where I cover the canvas with dark paint and then I use my paper towel. Um, I grew up really quite dyslexic, and I find that this weird way of painting and designing in reverse really works with my brain. I have no idea if they're actually correlated or not, but you know, it sounds cool. Make sure you guys feel a little bit of pity for me. Um, Leaves, you know, we actually had on um, Cola Park, 
And the guy leaves, I was like, Anton, what are you doing, man? I, was, I don't know. I just, I, I'm playing in Australia now. <laughs> And that's kind of how it feels. Sometimes I'm like painting alone and I'm like, now I'm playing Monet, now I'm playing Anton Mavlenko and losing all my paint. And, um, You're 15 minutes again. Oh, thank you. Take off the music. Does that happen? Yeah, yeah. It's, so in the studio, at least for me, and I, I'm sure for Anton as well, I'm constantly stepping back. Um, our paintings, even mine, which is much more, can feel tighter than Anton's, are not meant to be viewed from up close, you know, all the time. I don't mind, I like it when people look up close because that means they're curious, but they're meant to be viewed from about this distance generally, at least arm's distance. And so when you're actually painting, you can get so stuck up in the details that aren't important. It's that, what does it look like from this distance? So it's nice to have space to step back and stuff. So when you see us doing this, it's uh, partly that. It's taking it in. How does it appear from a bit of a distance? Yeah, yeah and I'll take, often take breaks. If you pay that location of the way we're painting, I'll just go for walks and I'll move it up just to kind of clear the palette. Yeah, I have a cat that reminds me constantly to take breaks. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a good thing. Is every, you know, at least hour, step back, maybe even more often than that. Step back, get some clear eyes on it, see what's going on. Um, there's parts, you know, you don't want to fall in love with anything too early in the painting. You don't want to start protecting any areas. You want to be able to just continually make changes. And uh, it's important that when you see mistakes like this one, um, <laughs> you fix them. You made it on that Right. I usually do. And so I noticed like right away Michael is really 
painting a lot thicker than um, he typically does as well. And I think he's doing the same thing. I'm playing in tough. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I, I don't even know how Anton puts on the super, super thick stuff. Like, I really don't. Um, and so it is fun for me. I do like thicker paintings. It's just when I'm doing them. And I love Monet. I love Monet. I've done so many shows all over the world. Um, you know, I'm so inspired by his work and it's everything about it. But whenever I paint like that, I mean, I, I literally do. I think of that story about Anton talking in you know, with an Australian accent, is I'm <laughs> pretending. It just doesn't quite feel like my stuff. So, what's that? I don't remember any of that. Oh, really? Shh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> you did, I don't remember. Yeah. 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 Synthetic brushes are, you know, 
synthetic, and they're a lot of times very much softer than hog hair bristle brushes. Um, we can get into the weeds a little bit with that, like it's actually chunking hog hair intertwined, you know, bristle brushes from you know, a certain area of China is my favorite. Um, and it's just because they keep their shape a little better, they don't seem to explode out like this. They kind of keep this form even when I'm really mean to them. Um, yeah, the reason I probably have the bristle brushes is because they, they're not as uniform as the synthetics, and they, mm -hmm. each brush does take on its own kind of character. Like some of them just like in a really unique way, and some of them are just abnormally softer than others. Like this is a really soft brush. That I'm um, like, it's not stiff enough to kind of like scumble in. Or I'll, I'll just use it for different reasons, and they end up taking on like a character personality of their own. Yeah, so it's like, you do have favorites, not favorites, or at least not it's brands. Not even it's brands, yes, yeah, favorite brushes, yeah, yeah, because you'll get two brushes that are exactly the same brand, and they end up becoming different brushes over time. Um, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, name them. Yeah. Start naming them after your favorite uncle and your least favorite uncle. And... No, wait, my therapist will be not. Oh, okay. Two hours is obviously pretty great. You know, it's a final piece of work. Have you ever tried the Bob Ross 30 minute approach? <laughs> 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 Yeah, I was painting in the, uh, what are, what's the Tillamook, uh, the uh, tulips, the tulip fields out in Woodburn. Mm -hmm. I was painting out there. That's so much stuff. There's so much information that I was out there painting and I'm thinking I'm doing this great job and I get this guy sitting behind me kind of watching quietly. And uh, I mean, it was a very difficult painting for me. Uh, and he finally just comes up and I'm like, so what do you think? He's like, the guy on TV would have already been done. It's not really nice to get Dad to say that. Yeah.
Yeah, that's the nice thing again about oil paintings is we have that time to work on it, we have that time to step back. Um, there's times when you are only hurting your painting. Um, you know, I could have made a joke right there. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's times where it's just the best thing you do is just take a break or put on a different canvas, oh, yeah. um, switch paintings. Uh, I, I actually really enjoy when I'm not under like, uh, deadline for shows or commissions or whatever, and I can just walk into my studio and have my like 15 paintings in progress. And I literally walk in and I'm like, who wants to play? <laughs> and you know, that whatever paint raises its hand, and off we go. Um, You're 15 again. All right. Yeah, this is where we'll start definitely deviating more from the references and uh, trying to figure out what color scheme. I mean, well, what would look interesting, what will make it pop, what will make it our own. Um, thanks to whoever, again, offered to let us use their photo, but... <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, right? 
especially me, what I sell in galleries. You also do abstracts. Oh, yeah, that's much more abstract. Yeah, yeah. There's a, yeah, there's some abstracts that, which I, I always just kind of think that they're landscapes, so feel like they are. I, um, again, coming from the illustration background, did tons of people, tons of whatever, you know, whatever the assignment was. Um, and so I, I feel like I could do lots of different things, um, but definitely my love and heart is in light and atmosphere, light and atmosphere. Um, so trying to incorporate that even whenever I'm doing other things. Um, I do do commissions, and that's often got a figure or two in it, um, just because you know, they want to have that personal relationship. I don't do like out and out portraiture anymore. Um, I will just suggest them to another artist if they ask me. Um, and I've even done a couple whimsical, like like my old style stuff on commission. Um, when my daughter was five years old, she saw an old illustration I'd done of a little girl in bed reading to a very scared giant dragon in the bed. And she's reading about a brave knight who just kills a dragon. And it's called The Red Fairy, is the name of the book. And um, oh, that's like a psychologically heavy painting. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like, why are you reading? A giant buddy. And well, she's trying to, you know, oh, it gets better. Or maybe it doesn't kill when he's chasing the dragon. Um, and then when my daughter saw it, she was super upset that I didn't use her as the little girl. I didn't use them, you know, she wasn't even born yet. I didn't use the neighbor <laughs> as my model. So I actually went and repainted it with her as my model. And we made the dragon progressively huger. I mean, we, we got a really big canvas. We made it so big that he was wrapping. His neck was too big to even fit in. And he was really scared. He had the sheets up around his nose. And um, in the original painting, there's a... Uh, painting by the little girl, obviously, kind of a stick figure's family photo, and it's, you know, her, mom, dad, uh, a dog, a brother, and then this big dragon. And um, anyways, I was putting that into the new painting, and my daughter comes home from kindergarten and just, I, I, it's all stories about my daughter, evidently, today. She just starts bawling instantly. It's like, what's the matter? She's like, I was going to do that part. <laughs> No, that's yeah. the lesson for today. Kids should not do art. So have you ever attempted to top the dragon in and like, put a dragon on top of a haystack or on a fish roll? <laughs> What's that? Are you ever attempted to put a dragon like, on top of a haystack or on a fish roll? Toss a dragon <laughs> some of your newer work? It's probably not going to sell well. It probably would, except for right across the street from, what's his name? Um, oh. Oh. The guy who's the Handel? Yeah, Saito. 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 Who's, you know, such a sweet, Cool guy. I love when we see his work. Um, so yes, I definitely used to think about it more when there was that crossover. But no, I, I really don't. Um, I used to do you know lots of paintings with mere mermaids in them for different projects and things too. And uh, yeah, I don't ever really think about throwing a mermaid onto the beach. Um, might be cool. Maybe maybe you're, you've opened up a whole new uh, thing in artwork for me. Yeah, exactly, yeah, it all goes full circle eventually. It's not the airbrush. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
octubre. Did everybody get a chance to come up and see like the marbling in the paints? Oh yeah. Like all the different colors within a single brush stroke. And yeah, again, that's just not something that shows up very often in my painting, but you know, when it does and it works, I'm sure excited about it. So it's fun to have this kind of excuse and then go, oh, you know, I could actually make this much more interesting with brighter, warmer colors, mixed in with pools. And, um, one thing to see with Anton is when I mix my piles of paint, I mix them pretty thoroughly, get them, you know, so that the color is pretty consistent. And when Anton mixes his colors, it's just a couple of swishes so that the colors are not fully, fully mixed so that when you come up to the canvas, they're optically mixing for you. Um, you just put the colors close enough together. Am I right on that? Yep. Cool. Yeah, I have to like scrape them off every once in a while. Like, just take your clothes. The boxes get so heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it really does. Yeah, yeah. Your paint's your most heavy thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and Anton again, he squeezes out like, is that an entire tube of white paint? Okay, pretty much. Pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Precious, precious. Yeah, and that's a lot of paint for me. It's on there, right? I have him squeeze out the double. <laughs> Impress me. <laughs> Do you use this fast map continually? I did not. Okay. Do you have any ones continually? I think so. Is it not on the table right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yes. Is this Indian yellow? Uh, yes. Oh, wow. Do you just do you? You don't use it transparently though, right? Uh, no. Oh yeah, I like it. It's like ten things, right? It does, it does, so. It is. Well, yeah. I don't, and I don't use it like gauntlets of it. Right. So. so that's the other thing is that uh, oil paints can be transparent, semi-transparent, semi-opaque, or opaque. Meaning, you know, transparent be like looking through a stained glass window all the way to looking through a brick wall. Um, and I like the transparent paints, of course, because I paint transparently, um, building things up. Um, Such a transparent thing. Yeah, very transparent. And uh, Anton, for the most part, is using opaque colors. Uh, so that, again, that just means they're different than I'm used to. Um, so I was kind of surprised just to see that Indian yellow is one of my very favorite colors, but it's also one of the most transparent colors on the palette. So I don't know why he's wasting it over here. <laughs> but it's a nice color, and it, like he said, he'll mix it with his other colors because even though it's transparent, it's still very strong. Um, so it affects, it's like a very strong herb, is how I think of uh, good of transparent colors. Um, you got your base, which is like the white paint or whatever else. Um, but transparent colors, when you're painting with opaque colors and transparent colors, colors I tell my students to think of it again as herbs or spices that you're adding to these other colors because they can't compete um, otherwise. So you're just using them to add a little flavor. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And you can't just pour yourself, pour yourself a bowl of herb. Mm -hmm. yeah. Enjoy. Yeah. That would have been my underpainting would have just been a bowl of, <laughs> of cumin. Um, is a whole other animal uh, when, you know, from painting in the studio 
or paintings and photos. And there's so many rewards to it, but it is punishing. Um, it can be, but I like to kind of think of it as like the extreme sport version of painting. Um, you're out there dealing with the weather, the rude people, and the <laughs> bugs, and the, all of it. You know, the changing light, the changing everything. Um, and it's, it can be so frustrating and so tricky, and it can also be just the most beautiful, amazing experience. Um, and often both all at the same time. It's something I used to do a lot more often, uh, and I hope to get back to it more. I really do like it. I've been busy enough with uh, galleries and clients and everything else that it seems almost like a luxury. Yeah, I used to paint almost exclusively there, and um, less and less over the years. You really? I thought you did still with them. No. Plus these two. Oh. Yeah, see, learning about hands on. You ever have a wooden dust pick one of your paintings? Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's why these easels are the best. But they're huge, right? Because they're super sturdy and you can weigh them. Um, yeah, the painting in the gorge? Holy cow. No, that that makes makes <laughs> um, Anton and I were painting down at... Uh, 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 what's the one? Uh, Hug Point. Hug Point? Is that what's called? Yeah. Um, and two crazy things. One, that's... A raccoon came and started digging through Anton's backpack right beside him. Is that you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then um, my painting got picked up and flew, and every time I'd almost catch up to it, just, <laughs> just like teasing me. Um, also, I was, in my early days, I used to show um, at street art festivals, you know, there's all these different steps you do as an artist of coffee shops and street art festivals and different things. You know, some people stick with that, which is fine. And awesome, but it's tough stuff. And uh, I was showing in Portland in an alleyway, and all those artists were lined up. And no joke, a pain just came. You just see it flying above everyone's heads. And I just watched it. I'm like, that's going to hit my eye. Boom. Yeah, it stuck into a huge painting. Just the corner of it just stabbed right through. And the guy just runs over. <laughs>
Yeah, it's so strange painting this way because, again, my paint style is so much more contemplative and slow and, you know, paint a couple brush strokes, step back, leave some tea, step back up, paint a little while. And so just kind of this almost attack mode is really, it is fun, but it's, it's different for me. But I have learned, again, I was saying a little bit ago about it becoming sculptural eventually. 
if you get it, you know, once you've covered your painting, you can actually, because they're oil paints, you can actually move them around and carve into them, you know, add and subtract. And I've really uh, been having fun experimenting with that and learning about that kind of style. I don't know if Anton ever thinks about it like that, but. So, because you, you literally <laughs> have enough paint to sculpt. that's dictating your painting choices, you know, like what right. sells, like everything else, but at the same time, like, yeah, you hope it's what you enjoy, what you're drawn towards again, because I think people can tell. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I do respect, like, the, uh, we're looking at a young artist, up and coming guy named Kyle Ma, and the guy just paints whatever he happens to be in front of him that day. Like one of these paintings, he just did a painting looking out at the airport while he's waiting for his plane. And it's such a strange subject. I would never think, like, let's paint all those fueling trucks and just the commotion down there, but it was nice. And it was, what a good challenge he took on for himself. And that'll definitely make him better at all things, is just being able to observe and paint. So you watch people like that, and you're just like, yep, yeah, he's going to do really good. So he definitely challenges himself. <coughs> You'll see both of us kind of stepping back more and more often. Now as you kind of, hopefully we're getting to the, a little bit of the finesse and reworking stage so you kind of
kind of trying to get that little bit of distance, especially on a slightly bigger canvas like this. And squinting our eyes will help us read the values a little better. And if you see us turning our heads, that's often to help us read color relationships better. At least that's for me. I don't know why Anton does that. I saw um, this. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, when you see a painting upside down, it's similar to seeing it kind of reversed in the mirror. It's an easy way to just keep a fresh glance at, at the work. And you often find mistakes and errors and corrections a lot easier that way. values are what's catching people, the lights and the darks. Hey, Robert. Hey, Dan. Um, and that's what's catching their attention. And then they'll be like, you get up a little closer and it becomes more about the colors. And mm -hmm. if you get them to here, you're like, oh man, cool. They actually like it. They're curious. And if they get up to here, then they're very curious. Like, how was this built? How was this made? Um, you know, you sold the painting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you touch it, you buy it. Um, you're too interested. Um, but it really is like, you know, in lieu of, you know, the best thing a person can do, of course, the most, the best way we can give you think is, of course, the baby person buys it, takes it home, puts it in the home. And, uh, but also just attention. It's, you know, we know there's so many galleries in town. We know there's so many artists in town. And, uh, you know, if you see people just slowing down for a little bit to observe your painting, or better yet, you know, hey, you know, Susan, you gotta come see this. Um, that's nice. That's you know, also kind of what we're aiming for to a degree. <laughs> Sounds weird. But the average person looks at a painting for three seconds. So anything above that is a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have done two hours, suckers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you guys are all well about everything. Don't you know they, they look so different up close than they do from a distance. Yeah, yeah, and what fun, right? Yeah. That's, you know, yes. I have students who say that. I'm like, I like my painting from here, but not from here. I'm like, that's fine. That's it. I mean, Monet's paintings completely fall apart when you get close to them. And that's part of the magic of it, is how did he know that from 30 feet back that this water lily would magically appear on these you know, huge, mad dashes of paint. A 
and no disrespect to the super refined, super realistic, highly detailed painters. That's just not me, and obviously not Anton. Um, <laughs> and that's, you know, I've got one of my very best friends doesn't really like my work very much. And if we're right here, no, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he's always like, why don't you do, you know, he likes like the old, like, when you look at the history books, and there's like every Civil War figure, you know, thousands of them, and they're all perfectly, he wants that kind of stuff. Um, and that's what I like, and I like that there's different art for different tastes, um, you know.
figure out how that challenge could work. Where we do one Anton style and one more Mike style. But I kind of like this meeting in the middle. And like I said, I have a lot of fun having an excuse to use all of Anton's paint. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be Gordon. Almost paper towels. So have you guys ever done the exact same scene when you started doing I guess we'd be two other paintings, <laughs> right? Yeah, I don't know exactly what the purpose would be to do it. Because, I mean, I guess we would start it slightly differently so it could kind of branch out. Uh, 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 yeah. I think if you didn't trade, um, then yeah. you did it yourselves. Oh, yeah, that would yeah, be that interesting. That makes sense. Afraid of the end, like of ruining it? Yeah. Yes. Especially how I did it. Did you ask that? Oh, yeah. Um, so I took in, what, three almost finished paintings into the gallery to do as demos during the last couple days, and uh, I glazed in on top. And that's immensely scary because I've worked already a couple, three weeks on these paintings, and now I'm doing, I'm going to cover every inch of it at the end. And you really hope it's dry enough, because otherwise you can just smear all your paint around. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that can can go wrong on that stage. Um, but it's so fun to see how... It, so this painting was all blues and grays, and I glazed in all the warm colors um, and a couple different layers. And I think it needed it. I love the you know how it offsets the other thing. Um, but uh, it's... Yeah, it's scary. Especially, again, you're doing it in the gallery in front of people. Yeah, I saw you doing it yesterday, or the day before, I guess. And that's actually a little bit about a scene on um, the new Sea Star video that Daniel Dancer did. There's a, you can see that there's some blaze on there, but he just took a pot and started rubbing it. I mean, it does look really scary to me. It is scary. I've got to say that Michael and Anton are two of the most courageous artists I know when it comes to what they'll do and come to people. <laughs> we now have our quote for the day. So I did with that one. Yeah. Um, so 
I like the painting, they like the painting. It was the same story as this one. It was much cooler, blues and grays, and they really liked it. We, they took it to their uh, home on the beach, to a beautiful home, and uh, we they called Eva and let her know, you know, I think the painting's not gonna work. Take it back. Um, I offered to go pick it up, I think even, or I don't know exactly the story, or maybe I just went out to see it. Um, and the, their roof was very similar to this, much, lots of warm wood colors. And I was like, oh, I know what we can do. We can just warm this painting up. They liked everything about it besides it was just a touch too cool, and it really was. Huh. It just didn't work. You know, and I'd like to say I'm a purist artist, and nah, you know, but no, nah, I want people to be happy. I want. I want the painting to work, I want them to be happy with it, I want it to, and, uh, and the painting did end up in fact better. Not only did it fit the space better, but I, I actually really liked it a lot better. And the funny thing was, is we could have sold it two or three times after I did that, while I was sitting in the gallery drawing, we got a lot of like, oh. Um, so, anyways. Hopefully, you know, Respect me less for that. Now I'm just kind of taking down some of the, the orange that's shining through. If you have too, too much, it's just not that special, but you have to just kind of the right amount. Um, you know, otherwise it can kind of appear a little bit like a force field or something sticking out around the thing. Um, So now, you know, with Anton's paint style, there's so much paint on here. I really, if I try to push at all, I kind of just lay it on, barely letting it sit. It's like adding cake frosting on top of cake frosting. And if I push it all, I'll just smear and smudge and, you know, want to mix with the colors underneath, which I can use to a degree, but if I do want to just put color on top, it's really, the bristles almost won't touch the paint or the canvas at all. You just, it picking the paint off the brush. We 
which is again something I don't really have to deal with too much in my painting style. So it's kind of a fun little challenge. Do you notice that? That you're touched? Yeah, you can see it. See how our pinkies all of a sudden start to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is what we're supposed to be having our tea. Um, but yeah, you just, your grip changes from the beginning where it's very firm and strong, almost a fencer's thing, to eventually one finger off, two fingers off, and eventually just barely, barely. Stuck. <laughs> I'm really impressed, you guys, for stay, staying around. Um, I mean, we actually have more people at the end than the beginning, so that yes. hopefully means something has gone right today. Um, but it really does mean a lot to Anton and myself that you guys, um, you know, the beach is beautiful, the weather is beautiful, and you guys are in here with us. And uh, we don't take that for granted at all. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. I think we would have been happy if we had eight of you and seven of you would have been my family. <laughs> So again, the paintings will be available through Dragonfire Gallery. Um, the proceeds do go, or at least a large portion of the proceeds, do go uh, to the um, five different uh, charities. Um, and the paintings are even discounted on top of that. So get a good deal, get an interesting story, you saw them win, and uh, help out all these really great uh, charities that are helping with the uh, environment and everything else. And um, I like to think of this as kind of, you know, as this is the end of the uh, Earth and Ocean Festival, I think that makes us obviously the grand finale. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, um, but anyways, uh, if we can, you guys, Eva put, and her, uh, her staff, put an immense, immense, immense amount of work into this whole festival and everything else that they've done. And hopefully you guys have really 
appreciated all the different events and things that were going on. So please, please, please. <laughs>